Wow, that's loud. Uh, thank, thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for coming from all over the state. It's, uh, we're obviously here for today's summit on bias, hate, and violence. I want to give a special thanks to Governor Murphy and Lieutenant Governor Oliver. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, U.S. Attorney Phil Selinger, members of our state legislature, of course, my partner, Colonel Callahan, county prosecutors from all across the state, law enforcement officials, and too many community and faith leaders to name. Um, I thank you not only for joining us today, but for your steadfast commitment and partnership in this ongoing fight to reduce hate and violence here in New Jersey. In particular, I want to thank the governor and the lieutenant governor, both for being here and their support, but most importantly, for leading an administration, in which I'm proud to serve, that has been committed to using a whole of government approach to combat the rise of bias and hate. It, it really is great to see so many of you here, so many leaders who are committed to building a safer and more inclusive state. But the truth is I wish we didn't have to gather today. The idea for this summit was born in the wake of the awful tragedy in Buffalo. And I want to thank in particular uh, Larry Hamm and Scott Richmond who reached out to the governor and me in the moments literally after that shooting and suggested we host for the first time in a long time a statewide summit on bias and hate. Of course, that awful day, 10 women and men were slaughtered simply because of the color of their skin. They were gunned down while performing the most basic tasks, a trip to the supermarket, picking up a surprise birthday cake for a three-year-old, buying a strawberry shortcake, making a grocery run for a relative. These are things we all do every single day, things that should never get someone killed. And yet we know, as horrific as they are, it's not only the incidents of mass or even fatal violence that are plaguing our communities. It's the steady drumbeat of hate that is all too prevalent across our country and across our state. It's the swastika drawn on a gym locker. It's the noose hung on a tree. It's the Chinese restaurant that's defaced. It's the teenager bullied because he's gay. These incidents stay with victims for a lifetime. I know I remember growing up in New Jersey being called anti-Semitic slurs on a soccer field. But I never had to fear for my life simply because I went to the grocery store. And yet for too many people in this country and in this state, that is their reality. Too many people are afraid. Afraid because of how they look, or where they're from, or how they pray, or who they love. And that's what we're here today to address. In April, my office released the 2020 Bias Incident Report, as well as, as, well as preliminary bias incident data for 2021. This data is compiled by the state police and shared publicly every month. And I'll be honest, it's alarming. 1,871 bias incidents in 2021 were reported. That's 29% higher than 2020, and it represents the highest number of annual bias incidents reported in New Jersey since we began collecting this data in 1994. In just the past six years, bias incidents have risen by 400% in our state. And we're seeing this trend across every demographic group. Anti-Asian bias up 87% anti-LGBTQ plus bias, up 65%, anti-black bias, up 39%, and still is the most common racially motivated bias incident in the state. Anti-Jewish bias, up 16%. I could go on. The small piece of good news is that one reason for this increase is that we've enhanced our reporting abilities. As some of you know, New Jersey now has, and I'm proud to say, the most comprehensive bias incident reporting system in the country. Recently, we've made it even easier for folks to report a complaint. They can do it now online. And it's important to note as well that bias incidents are still woefully underreported. We know the data we have is just a snapshot of what's actually occurring. But you should also know and have confidence that each report that comes in is thoroughly investigated. If charges are warranted, criminal charges, we'll bring them. And I want to recognize the work Prosecutor Billheimer in Ocean County that recently charged a 
terrorism case in response to an awful uh, bias incident um, against uh, Jews in Lakewood. U.S. attorney charged a bias crime in the same case in the federal system. So we will bring charges when they're appropriate. But even when an incident doesn't rise to the level of a bias crime, we use these reports to inform our policy response and we can pursue civil recourse where appropriate. But of course, we know that the rise in bias incidents is not strictly due to increased reporting. Hate and bias are on the rise. And we also know why that's the case. Just listen to the rhetoric used by too many people in positions of authority. Rhetoric that blamed the Asian American community for the coronavirus pandemic. Rhetoric related to the civil unrest following the George Floyd murder. And rhetoric surrounding the 2020 election, just to name a few. This rhetoric can spread like wildfire on social media platforms that have failed to live up to their obligations under their own terms of service, something we'll touch on more fully today. And once this rhetoric spreads on social media, people act on it. And they act on it in truly violent and dangerous ways. Here in New Jersey, with the support of the governor and the lieutenant governor, we've undertaken a number of actions to address this rise in bias incident. We've improved our state's policies on bias crime to include gender, disability, and national origin. And we've updated our standards governing how we investigate and prosecute these crimes so that we're being even more aggressive in pursuing these cases. Our Division on Civil Rights continues to thoroughly investigate complaints of bias and discrimination, and it's played a critical role in implementing the recommendations of the Youth Bias Task Force. And as I mentioned, the whole of government approach, I thank the governor for signing legislation that will mandate various forms of diversity education in our schools, curricula that I believe will save lives. I also mentioned the role of social media. We have led national investigations into social media platforms. Just last month, we launched, in, in the wake of the Buffalo shooting, we launched a new investigation into the platforms Discord and Twitch. These investigations will seek to determine if the platforms are violating state consumer protection laws by failing to moderate harmful content and enforce policies that prevent violence extremism. And I commit to you that we'll continue to hold social media platforms accountable for the harms they are causing in our communities. We're using every available resource in our state to address the epidemic of gun violence, which all too often plays a role in bias crimes. Last year, we created a statewide gun violence reduction task force and an intelligence sharing network that will help us better lead investigations and prosecute violent crimes. Through this effort, we've held violent individuals and gun traffickers accountable, and I thank all of the prosecutors for their partnership. And of course, we stand ready and eager to use the tools proposed in the governor's gun safety 3.0 legislative package, tools that I know will save lives. I'm incredibly proud of the work we're doing in this state to address bias, hate, and violence, but there is so much more to be done. And I also recognize that the most effective tools we have are our partnerships between law enforcement and the communities that we serve. That's why today's event is so critical. And it's also why I'm announcing today that I've asked every county prosecutor in New Jersey to hold a community event that's specifically focused on hate and bias. We're making funding available from our office to support these events so that we can ensure that we have the opportunity to engage as many people across the state on what we call blue sky days, I'm stealing the colonel's term, when we are responding to a crisis. Because it's only by working together that we can effectively stop and slow the spread of hate. As I was preparing for this event, I couldn't help but think that last Friday marked the seventh anniversary of the awful shooting at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, which claimed the lives of Reverend Clem Pickney and eight of his parishioners. I've told some of you this story, but I wasn't in government at the time, and in the days that followed, I went down to Charleston and I prayed with countless others outside of Mother Emanuel. And while I was there, I met a mother who brought her eight-year-old son to church that day. They were members of the church. And she told me that she brought her son there that day so that he could see that people went to his church to love people and not to hate people. That boy is 15 today, and here we are seven years later, fresh off another spate 
of violent tragedies. And I can't help but think that we failed him. And we failed countless children like him who are growing up afraid. Afraid because of some perceived difference. But I also haven't lost faith because I believe what we all believe, that being the most diverse state in the nation is something that we lift up, not something that we run from. And I'm proud to work in an administration that stands for the proposition that everyone is welcome. I know that by coming together as we are today, we can build bonds that will make our communities stronger, safer, and more secure. So I'm so grateful to have so many of you join us. I look forward to listening today, to learning from you, and to recommitting ourselves to this collective and critical effort. I want to real quickly thank the organizers from my office, particularly Sandeep Iyer and Bryn Whittle, as well as the governor's office for their support. These events are very difficult and they did an extraordinary job. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Imam W.D. Sharif for the invocation. who can appreciate the salutation of peace be upon you all. To Governor Murphy, to Attorney General Platkin, to Lieutenant Governor Oliver, and to our U.S. Attorney General Salinger, please join me in a invocation, a short prayer, and then we will follow with a moment of silence for all those who were victims of the violence of bias and hate. <clears throat> we seek refuge with Almighty God from Satan, the rejected enemy. With God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. All praise belongs to Almighty God, the Lord, cherisher, and sustainer, guardian and evolver of all the systems of knowledge. The merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, master of the day of judgment. You alone do we worship. In your aid do we seek. Guide us on the straight path, the path of those upon whom you have bestowed your grace, not of those who earn your punishment, nor of those who go astray. And may we now observe a moment of silence. Amen. Thank you. It's now my honor to introduce Colonel Callahan. I think everyone in this room knows the kind of leader that the Colonel is. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Colonel has joined the same prayer call every morning since the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, he is truly a a remarkable leader, not just a law enforcement leader, but a remarkable leader in our communities, and he's the best partner I could possibly have. So an honor to have Colonel with us today and say a few words. Thank you, General, uh, and thank you, Governor Murphy, and Lieutenant Governor Oliver. Uh, humbled and honored to be here. Uh, the General spoke of that call in the morning. I'm looking at, where's Reverend Green? Right here. It was his idea. March 13th, 2020, for me to get on and pray with faith-based leaders around the state. And we were praying about COVID at that time. Um, and there was an attraction to that call because it was built on a foundation of relationship. And that, that love and lightness is what was going to drive out darkness in whatever form that was, if that was in the form of COVID or if that was in the form of hate and bias crime. Um, and I joined that call every day and I'm still on it. I prayed this morning about this and about what would come of this beyond just words that were spoken, but the action that would be taken. And it's a multiple pronged approach, whether that's education initiatives, prosecutions, things that are going to make a difference. 
And I thought about that prayer call, Rev. I was three months into it when George Floyd was murdered. And I wondered if I had gotten on that call for the second time at the end of May. I was the only white person on the call. I am the only law enforcement officer on the call. They had heard me pray for 90 days straight. And it was a painful call. And we've had it again and again. Buffalo, you think of the things we've prayed for in two plus years. Uvalde, Philadelphia, time and time again. But we're not getting to know each other around yellow crime scene tape here. We're getting to know each other at churches and at barbecues and at basketball games. And that's what's going to make the difference, especially with our youth, when our youth see that. I was with a, a kindergarten class last week. I wanted to go back to the class where I went to kindergarten. I looked at the face of these five and six-year-old boys and girls, and not one of them had hate in them because it's a taught thing hate is. And I thought, where would they be in 10 or 15 years ago? With these, right? Easy to hit send and send a painful message. And we have troopers out there. We call it trooper talk, talking about bias and hate and social media and proliferating hate uh, in a time and in a country where uh, we're so fascinated with picking sides and teams. And if you're not on my side, you're on a dark side. On and on, we see that uh, division I was asked last week at a men's Bible group what I thought the greatest challenge was to law enforcement. And I think it's division. Uh, and we have to stand in the middle of that, that thin blue line. Uh, I also read this week, uh, and I found it resonated with me, we live in a culture that is more comfortable seeing two men holding guns than holding hands. You think about that statement. It was pretty powerful to me. And I think it's incumbent upon each one of us here, not only within these walls of this institution, but out on the streets, the Larry Hams of the world, to go out there with our youngest ones from the time they're five, that we show them what love is all about, that we show them that example of what being a peacekeeper is, and about Jesus when he stood on that Sermon on the Mount and talked about, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. He didn't say, blessed are the warriors. He didn't say blessed are the haters. It's up to us to be the peacemakers and the guardians of peace to make sure that love and lightness drives out darkness and hate. And I am humbled and honored to be a part of that, Governor. God bless. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Colonel. One quick housekeeping. You've all received little cards on it. There's a QR code, which I think we're all familiar with now. Uh, you can use that to submit questions. We do want it to be interactive. There's also old-fashioned postcards with pencils if you can't figure it out, so we'll make that available too. Um, it's now my honor to introduce the United States Attorney, Philip Selinger. President Biden had the good sense to nominate um, Philip in October of last year. He was confirmed to his position in December. Um, he is an incredible partner. Um, someone who I've known for a long time, as has the governor, and we're very fortunate to have in New Jersey the type of tight-knit state, federal, and local partnerships we have because we know that it takes a village to respond and prevent these types of incidents. So, Phil, appreciate you being here and share a few words. Thank you, uh, General. I, I can think of no better partner for the law enforcement efforts that we have to combat hate and bias on the federal and state level in partnership than General Platkin, Governor Murphy. Uh, our offices, the Attorney General's, U.S. Attorney's offices, meet regularly and work together addressing issues of hate and bias, and uh, thank you, General and Governor, for your inspired leadership. Let me be clear that combating hate is central to the mission of the United States Attorney's Office and one of our highest priorities. The Department of Justice was created after the Civil War, and it was created, its first mission was to fight 
the activities of the Ku Klux Klan in defeating the civil rights of uh, black American citizens. And hundreds of prosecutions were launched by the Department of Justice at that time. More recently, those of us who are old enough, myself, Governor Murphy, we remember the civil rights movement of the 60s when the Department of Justice walked arm in arm escorting black students to universities in the South, forcing government officials and administration officials to allow those students entry to school. And the Department of Justice prosecuted the most heinous lynchings, church bombings, and murders during that period. And has been indicated by General Platkin, hate and bias is, remains terribly important uh, today. So because of the dramatic increase in hate and violence, when I became U.S. Attorney, one of the first acts I took was to create a civil rights division within the United States Attorney's Office, which brought together both criminal and civil, civil rights attorneys working together to combat and combat hate and bias, protect civil rights. We added resources to that department division and it's now been a force multiplier. General Platkin talked about uh, the efforts of the uh, county prosecutor and my office to bring hate crime uh, charges against the perpetrator of an attack, a violent attack, against visibly identifiable members of the Orthodox Jewish community. A couple of weeks ago, my office, after a jury trial, obtained a conviction of a Patterson police officer for violating the civil rights of a citizen who it was his job to protect. And that was the sixth conviction we have had of Patterson police officers for civil rights violations. We all know that violence can devastate a community, but civil rights violations, particularly by those in power, can be incredibly destructive as well, as we have seen far too often. On the civil side, the U.S. Attorney's Office also has robust enforcement efforts. We are overseeing consent decrees to enforce constitutional policing in uh, Newark, who has become one of our strongest partners in a violent crime initiative. Uh, we brought a sexual harassment case uh, with respect to attacks in the state's only uh, women's prison and sexual harassment litigation involving uh, a landlord discriminating against women, excuse me, harassing and sexually assaulting women and gay men in what became the largest enforcement uh, action in the Department of Justice's housing discrimination uh, history. And we also prioritize enforcement actions to protect the faith communities. As some of you know, several years ago in Bernard's Township, uh, a mosque was uh, sought to be built and the township erected discriminatory barriers when there was a right uh, under the zoning ordinances to construct. And after years of proceedings, the, the application to build a mosque was denied teaming up with an extraordinary leader who was going to be speaking on one of your panels today, Dr. Ali Chowdhury, we filed a lawsuit forcing Bernard's Township to allow the mosque to be built, and I am very pleased that that mosque uh, will open later this year. And just last week, we obtained a court order uh, directing Jackson Township uh, to remove discriminatory barriers against the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. So events like this, as uh, General Platkin said, are incredibly important. 
uh, the relationships that are built between law enforcement and the community is critical to the trust that encourages hate crime reporting. And hate crime reporting is one of the critical steps in combating hate uh, and violence. Last year, my office launched with uh, our uh, Assistant Attorney General from Washington, a United Against Hate initiative, and we've been meeting with community groups across the state. General Platkin, I was very pleased, came to our, our initial launch, and other members of his department and the uh, state uh, Civil Rights Division have attended subsequent launches throughout the state. So uh, uh, we very much appreciate uh, their support, and we look forward to working with you on those efforts uh, going forward. So thank you again in closing, uh, General Platkin, uh, Governor Murphy, uh, not only for hosting this event, but for your rigorous efforts in combating hate, combating bi bias, uh, and violence. Thank you. It's now my honor to introduce Lieutenant Governor Oliver. I think everybody knows her, her credentials at this point. First black woman speaker in state history, first woman of color elected statewide office in New Jersey, but that really just doesn't even scratch the surface. For those of us who've had the privilege to work with her, she's worked at every level of government in this state and has improved the lives of so many people, in particular in the city that we're currently sitting in, and it's an honor for me to serve with her, and I appreciate so much that you'd be here today. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, for some time now, I've had this uh, refrain in my head. Going back several years, there is a foul mood permeating the United States. And the state of New Jersey is not shielded, shielded from that foul mood. When I think of uh, bias and hate and violence, I think there is one factor that promulgates it. And that factor is ignorance. Ignorance sits at the bottom of all of the kinds of incidents you have heard everyone talk about today. When I think about violence in Lakewood, violence in Jersey City, violence and bias right here in the city of Newark, you cannot visit any county in this state and not have people share with you experiences with bias, violence, and hate. I believe it stems from ignorance. It's often described that uh, right here in our own state that we live in such segregated communities, and we do, but we are seeing that demographic change. As people have come to our state for better living conditions for their families, access to a quality education, and the ability to take advantage of all the things that our state has to offer, we learn that many of our communities are now multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi religious communities. Just think about Pittsburgh, what occurred in Pittsburgh two years ago. Think about what recently happened to several yeshivas in the city of New York. All around us, not just in our own tri-state area, but around the country, we have seen the emergence of bias, violence, and hate. Let's begin to think about ignorance. 
reference has been made by several before me that dealing with youth and addressing youth at earlier ages, that is where it begins. It begins in our preschool classes. It begins in our K-12 system of education in New Jersey. And something that I'm very proud of, if you visit one of the 57 universities uh, and colleges in our state, take a stroll around a campus and you will see that generation interacting with one another, not allowing those biases and that hate and even thinking about violence to enter into their minds. In New Jersey, uh, Governor Murphy very early on created a governmental environment that bias, violence, and hate would not be tolerated within our own state government because we're not immune from, from bias or hate either. Subsequently, uh, under the leadership of the Attorney General's office, uh, and when uh, A.G. Platkin was chief counsel to the governor, we created a number of standard operating policies that was designed to, uh, you know, frame out what the culture of the workplace would be in our state agencies. You all know that Governor Murphy made a commitment to have a diverse cabinet. And we do have a diverse cabinet. We know that Governor Murphy was very proud that most of his cabinet was composed of women. Because I don't want to leave out women in a conversation about bias, hate, and violence. But I'm glad that in this administration, we have firmed up a number of laws that speak to violence against women as well. Governor Murphy has made significant financial investments for us to establish some innovative and creative ways to confront this demon. A task force on youth in order to study and combat violence has been established. That task force is just about completed with its work and will offer recommendations to the governor, which the governor will review, and then we can move towards operalization of those recommendations. Governor Murphy also made a significant appropriation to 25 community-based organizations around the state so that at a grassroots level, we could have partnership with those that are on the ground, in neighborhoods, and in communities doing this kind of work. If you are like I, I cringe every night when I listen to the 11 o'clock or the 10 o'clock news. It always starts off with who has been shot, what elderly person has been pushed down on the ground? What Asian American has been attacked in Chinatown? What mosque or masjid has had hate speech written on it in addition to SWAT stickers? This confronts us each and every day. We're tired of saying enough is enough. We're tired of saying thoughts and prayers that lose their lives to violence. I hope that those of you that are here today in the various leadership positions that you hold will make a commitment to make certain that New Jersey is not just the garden state, not just the shore state, but that there is, as our New Jersey Civil Rights Division says, New Jersey is a state without hate. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. It's now my honor to ask Larry Hamm to come up and introduce the governor. I don't need to introduce Larry Hamm in Newark. I think everybody knows what he means to this city and to this state, and he's somebody who holds us accountable. And I say that in the best possible way. He makes us be better and do better, and I appreciate you being here. Governor Murphy, Lieutenant Governor Oliver, U.S. Attorney Selinger, Attorney General Platkin, Colonel Callahan, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The seriousness of the moment that faces us cannot be overstated. On May the 14th, an avowed 18-year-old white supremacist legally purchased assault-style weapons and body armor and went to a community that he had surveilled for weeks and went into the tops supermarket and killed in cold blood 18 black people, excuse me, 10 black people, most of whom, all of whom were African Americans. And while we're here to talk about the issue of bias, there's a confluence here with other issues. And one issue is we must have a nationwide ban on assault style weapons in this country. <laughs> Hearing about the racist massacre in Buffalo, New York, I was caught up in a storm of emotions. But I thought back to 1995 when Tim McVeigh blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City and killed 186 people, many of whom were children in a daycare center. In the aftermath, the FBI said at that time that there were 250 white supremacist organizations dedicated to the violent overthrow of the United States government. And then I thought about how Dylan Roof went into Mother Emanuel Church and killed nine black people while they were praying after inviting him into the church to pray with him. And then I thought about the white supremacist domestic terrorist attack on the government of the United States on January 6th. And since that time, federal and state agencies have said that the greatest danger to public safety in our country and in our state was violent white supremacist domestic terrorist organizations. And I thought about what we could do about this. And I thought back to September of 2001 when I was at the governor's conference on racial profiling in New Jersey. Do you remember that, Colonel? But the conference had to be abruptly adjourned because on that morning there was the attack on the World Trade Center. And so the work that we had come here to do, had come there to do, had been upended. And in fact, not only did we not end racial profiling, in some ways it became policy. But I thought about what we should do. What must we do about this? And I thought, well, based on the conference that we had 
in 2001, said maybe we could call a similar conference. And I reached out to Governor Murphy on Sunday, May 15th, the day after the racist massacre in Boston. And I suggested to the governor that we convene a summit of a similar type to that of 2001, bring together representatives from all sectors of law enforcement, our political bodies, academics, concerned citizens, so that we could not only talk about this, but come up with a plan of action. The same day after I reached out to Governor Murphy, that same day I received a call from Attorney General Platkin. And here we are 30 days later. I thank you, Governor Murphy, and your administration for this rapid response that we made at that time. Thank you so much. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce the governor of the state of New Jersey, Governor Philip Murphy. Thank you all. Wow. What a room. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank my friend Larry for that introduction. I just said to him privately, he's always good, but he's never been more powerful than this morning. So, Larry, let's hear it for you because you're the. He reminded me by showing me the text exchange from that Sunday, and uh, in many respects, it's because of your impetus that we're here and all the good work that the People's Organization for Progress does. And I remember meeting you in that basement uh, cafeteria many years ago, and, and uh, you've been right by our side ever since. And as Matt said, you challenge us in, in the very best sense of the word. Thank you for everything. Uh, to Acting Attorney General Matt Placken, I want to thank you for leading our administration's efforts to meaningfully combat bias wherever it pops up across our state. And it must be said that Larry and Matt and I, Reverend Green and others, were together. This is the second day in a row we've been together. Yesterday, commemorating Juneteenth, and today for this summit on bias incidents and hate crimes. As you may likely know that I've, I've known Matt for a long time, longer literally than any other member on our team. He was volunteer number one when it was cold, dark, and lonely. I know he takes this mission not just from a viewpoint of his professional obligation as New Jersey's chief law enforcement officer, but as a unique moral obligation, educated by, among other influences, his faith. I also give my deepest appreciation to your partners, Matt, in this effort, those who have already spoken including my incredible partner in government, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Y. Oliver, State Police Superintendent Colonel Pat Callahan, U.S. Attorney Phil Selinger, uh, Imam Dean Sharif, assalamu alaikum, to you and your colleagues. Phil mentioned this, and I think it is verifiably the case. I don't think any other state in America has a strong, a working relationship between the U.S. Attorney's Office on the one hand and the Attorney General and law enforcement at the state level, on the other hand, and it takes both sides of that uh, to make that happen. I want to give a huge, I also want to acknowledge Paramel Garg, our Chief Counsel. Paramel, thank you for your leadership. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to Rutgers University for hosting us today. This institution plays a tremendous role in all facets of the future of our state. And this mission includes ensuring that the students who walk into Rutgers as freshmen leave with all the tools to not only forge a successful career, but also the tools to be engaged and caring citizens of this nation and residents of this state. And that includes respecting the great diversity of our state. Not just respecting, I should say, but revering. Our diversity is truly one of our greatest strengths, if not our greatest strength. It has been for generations. And we will not shy from upholding and promoting these values. 
And with that, I thank each and every one of you with us today, with a particular thanks to all the panelists who will be presenting and speaking. So whether you're an elected official, member of law enforcement, prosecutor, faith leader, activists, con concerned citizen, it's an honor to be with you all today. And regardless of your role at this summit, after it ends, you will take with you, we all will, a responsibility to make New Jersey a model for all states in not only honoring our diversity, but ensuring that every resident of our state can live in peace and can work without prejudice toward achieving their American dream. I might also add there are many members of our administration here, and I thank them for being with us this morning as well. I don't think I need to repeat some of the statistics which those who have spoken before me have laid out. But suffice it to say, we all recognize that incidents of bias in New Jersey are increasing dramatically. Those numbers cannot be interpreted in any other way. Even if we accept the notion that part of this increase can be from a greater willingness on the part of those who have been the victims of bias to step forward, that is of little solace. Yes, we must applaud the bravery of those who refuse to sit silently and allow others to belittle or threaten, or in the worst cases, strike out violently against an individual who, by the way, has done them no harm, but by whom for some reason they feel intimidated. For them, this may be the hardest step to come forward. But the recognition is that if our numbers are increasing in part, and they are because of this willingness to step forward, that begs the question, how many previous acts have gone unreported, and how many of our fellow New Jerseyans suffered silently at the hands and mouths of their, their tormentors. For our young people especially, given the numbers of instances of bias reported to have occurred in their schools, the one place that, by the way, outside of their home is supposed to be the safest and most supportive, answering this question gives me chills, and I'm sure it does for many of you as well. And I'm doubly concerned given the erosion of our national political and social dialogue that Sheila so brilliantly laid out, we do appear to be regressing in so many cases. And for some, the recent instances of racially motivated hate, whether it be the murder of George Floyd or the wanton slaughter last month, as Larry powerfully laid out, of innocent black shoppers in Buffalo, that has elicited the exact opposite response than what it should. Amazingly, there are those who believe that the nat natural response to these incidents isn't to acknowledge hundreds of years of institutionalized racism, but to dig in their heels at, in ignorance, as Sheila said, to claim such, such issues either don't exist or worse yet, that they are, that they are somehow the victims. And I am certain these individuals did not spend their weekends pondering the meaning of Juneteenth or searching their own souls to ask for forgiveness for their own hatred or spending any time to come to terms with where such enmity comes from. I don't normally quote him, I have to admit, in fact, I don't think I ever have, but as a quick aside, the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre once wrote, and I quote him, the anti-Semite claims that the problems that he is facing are due to another race, another time, another event. In short, he is responsible for nothing. The anti-Semite is a man who does not hate the Jews, but since he does not feel in control of things, he hates himself. Now, Sartre has been debated for 70 years, but despite that, these words, I think, can be broadened to include all who profess hate. In fact, the news showed pictures over the weekend of racists espousing replacement conspiracy while marching in Tennessee to protect a Juneteenth commemoration, again, blaming others. And the same can be said for those who continue to show their ignorance and intolerance through anti-religious bias. And while the numbers show that religious bias is not limited 
to just one faith, and Imam Sharif knows the pain of anti-Muslim aggression, and while we take every act of anti-religious bias deadly seriously, I am particularly concerned by the sustained number of instances of anti-Semitism. I'm also greatly concerned by the increase in instances of bias against members of our LGBTQIA plus community, particularly the transgender community, and even so, more so trans youth. And what is most concerning to me here is that these numbers are increasing against a national backdrop of far-right politicians, including some of my own gubernatorial colleagues, actively campaigning to see who can make their states the most host hostile to their LGBTQIA plus residents. There's no doubt a connection that can be made from these politicians spouting hate and misinformation and trying to use the, those as a governing strategy, on the one hand, to the self empowerment of those bent on targeting the LGBTQIA plus youth at exactly the time, by the way, when they may be at their most vulnerable on the other. So where the statistics reported through the Attorney General's office are our call to action, today is about how we answer this call. I think the first part of any problem, as the saying goes, is acknowledging that one exists. And through this gathering, there is certainly none among us who needs to be convinced. Harder, though, are finding the strategies through which we can push down these numbers. Community engagement, yes. Education, yes. Reporting, yes. Enforcement of our laws, absolutely. But we should not, and I know you won't be, we should not be afraid to be creative. This is a state which has never shied from taking on the big challenges through out-of-the-box thinking. And today should be no different. Our goal should be no loftier than that of President George Washington, who responded to the fears of the congregation of Rhode Island's Toro Synagogue that the newly formed United States of America and its government would forget its Jewish residents by confirming to him that this would be a nation that, and I quote, gives to bigotry no sanction to persecution no assistance. Our history shows that we haven't always been perfect in this pursuit, but now is our time to make up for these past failures, including the failures, it must be said, within our state. And in doing so, we can live up to the remainder of President Washington's response to the Toro Synagogue congregation, and I quote the President, that everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree and there shall be none to make him afraid. So before Matt, I turn the program back over and you can begin in earnest your collective deliberations for today. I wanna to make note of part of the statistics which while I am certainly not grateful, I can say that I'm at least relieved that the majority of the reported instances of bias have been verbal. And thankfully none resulted in the death of any New Jerseyan. I fear for what our statistics could be if we did not have in place the smart and strong gun safety laws which have made us a national model. I fear for what could have been had weapons of war been as readily available in New Jersey as they are in other states. And I fear for what they could have been if New Jersey had the numbers of concealed weapons walking around our streets as other states, including, by the way, those which now no longer even require an individual to apply for a concealed carry permit. And I say all of this on the precipice of what we all expect to be an adverse U.S. Supreme Court decision any day now, potentially today, uh, on concealed carry. I think this is where the work you are undertaking today intersects with our continued efforts to further strengthen, strengthen our own gun laws to ensure that no weapon ends up in the wrong hands, especially hands under the control of a head full of hate. So let's continue to do all that we can on every front to ensure that every New Jerseyan can live lives full of respect and dignity. I'm not asking that we all must become best friends. That's probably not going to happen. But we can create a state where all are welcomed, 
all are respected and where all can live without fear under their own vine and fig tree. And in doing so, we will be doing more to promote our nation's 250-year experiment in, ex in securing liberty than we shall ever know. And again, I thank you all for having me today and for your taking today to be part of this summit. And I wish you the very best for a meaningful and productive day. And may God bl continue to bless the great state of New Jersey and the United States of America. Thank you. Another round of applause for the governor and all our speakers.